Hello, I'm Michael. Uh, I would like to share with you our developments when it comes to new technology. Whenever, as soon as I started the business, I always wanted to change the industry. And we're still a small company, but we've still done a plenty lot. And hopefully we will be able to gain more partners so that we can move things faster together. Uh, just to let you know, we will be recording this presentation because we stick it onto our blog. More than welcome to visit our website to see all our previous presentations and, and other videos. Just quickly about myself, I was born in South Africa, you might pick it up in my accent, although my parents were Polish, they're both doctors, they migrated there, moved back to Poland. I then graduated as an aeronautical engineer, but then after I arrived in the UK, I fell in love in the steel industry, and I'm happy to be with other, uh, others who are also passionate about the industry. I also very quickly learned after setting up that I'm most passionate about business and building scalable businesses. So in other words, businesses that work without the owner because the, bone, the owner becomes an overstressed uh, bottleneck to the business. Uh, so uh, it's been a long learning curve for myself and I also share my business knowledge with other entrepreneurs through various business presentations. Uh, I also have an interest in properties. The furthest, furthest north property I have had was in Rotherham, so it was just on the way here. I was just like, ah, oh. waved, although I sold it a few months ago. And also, I'm an enthusiast of sport, especially orienteering, which is running with a map and a compass. So it just gets your head involved. Uh, when it comes to our company, because we're based in London, we're quite lucky with the media coverage. They sort of pick out us and just call out of the blue saying that they would like to record something. And obviously they're more than welcome, we just want them as much as, as, as they wish to. Uh, the topic of my presentation is obviously about the 21st century, but it sounds a bit ironic that we, this topic is still up to date, even though we're in, well, 19 years into the century. But still, whenever I travel to many steel fabrication places, it really does feel like we are in the dark ages. And that is how I actually came across the steel industry after graduating and learning about all the parametric software and CNC machinery, robotics were coming. And then suddenly I came across the steel industry. It was like, oh my God, it felt like being moved back to the medieval times. And that is where my passion kicked in to start innovating. Now the question is why innovate? Because innovation for innovation's <laughs> sake doesn't make much financial sense uh, and is basically a waste of time. And I quite like the lean startup way of thinking that if you spend two years burning cash developing software and it fails, then you might as well have been spending the two years on a beach just sipping drinks and enjoying your time. So that is why we're very conscious about it and you really have to manage the expenses carefully so you innovate in the right direction. But we're obviously very familiar with the course of life. The next stage is a grave, unfortunately for us humans. But with businesses, as, as separate entities, the beauty of life is that we can actually constantly move back to our young ages, years, through innovation. And if we look at the largest companies in like McDonald's, they constantly reinvent themselves. And the direct result of that is the vibe within the company. There's a like special sort of energy within the employees and that is why innovation is very important. And this is just one reason, obviously this isn't the most important one. The next question when talking about innovation in steel is how long structural steel is going to be out there. Because if next year there's a super material coming out, then we might as well, all of us, go to the pub today and just stop wasting our time in developing steel. But luckily, uh, if you do some research, there's no material on the horizon that could be produced at lower rates than structural steel. So I reckon, and this is just my guess, it could be 20 to 50 years until there's a replacement material. So we're quite lucky uh, because the other upside of steel is that there's no shelf life. So as you know, as long as it doesn't rust, it can stay within the premises forever. And also the design doesn't change on an annual basis as it does in the fashion industry. So, so that's a big benefit to, to us. Uh, and I guess the most important reason why we need innovation are the demographics. 
and we can easily blame the millennials for being lazy, but we ourselves are spending our day to day in an office, we don't get our hands dirty, and that's the way the world is moving. People don't want to necessarily go back to working hard uh, with their hands, so unfortunately the number of skilled workforce is on the decline, and the direct result will be that the cost of labor will go up. And there are other industries like the oil and gas and other more specialist industries that will always be able to pay a pound more for a welder per, per hour. So that is why the structural steel industry is a bit of a threat of this happening and that is why we need to start thinking actively of replacing humans with robots not because we want to kick them out of their jobs, it's just because we will find it difficult to employ the right skilled workforce. Uh, this is my favorite machine manufacturer, Furtman. Uh, they've been developing this piece of art, uh, which I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with. It's called the Fabricator. Uh, but this is a product made for the large structures uh, because the welding times are roughly the same for small and large objects. So obviously if you have a one ton beam, it's going to pay better than having a 100 kilogram beam. The other issue that they've had uh, is the software because today the design of the connections in the hands of the detailers and they can produce anything they wish and then the software needs to translate that wish into a tool path and that is where a lot of issues happen so that is why our approach is to work and we're working together with the SCI to standardize connections and basically end up with a library of a finite amount of connections because then if, even if it's like 200 different connections it's much easier to program a robot it will be 200 paths, but still that is a, a finite amount. Uh, we we implement a lot of various ideas. Most of them don't work, but some of them do work. This is just an example. Uh, we sort of like to challenge the status quo. If something's done one way, we think, okay, well, let's find another way of doing the same thing. So like with keeping stock, most stockholders keep it on the floor with an overhead crane but that is a dead end in terms of automation because you would have to sort of guess where the steel is and then automate the overhead crane, which is doable, but it's much more complicated. So we've had our first approach at these, this kind of vertical rack storage, where as you can see at the bottom there are rollers and the final idea is to have an automated platform that would lift the steel work straight onto the rollers and into the bandsaw. Now another sort of idea behind the solution is that if you want to have a fully automated bandsaw with the infeed and outfeed, it's around 250,000 pounds. And the problem is that you have to move the steel work to the machine. And ideally, because you're moving it, you want to use the full bar. So in other words, you have to wait until the bar is fully utilized. So a lot of nesting. Uh, and the other thing is that if that machine is down for whatever reason and machines do break down, then that 250 grand machine basically is at a standstill, is not generating any money. Whereas here, these bandsaws, they cost 8,000 pounds. They are on rollers and on rails and we move them from left to right and then each rack has its own welding uh, bandsaw. So if one machine is down, we can easily just move them around so uptime is, is guaranteed. And also you might argue that, well, this is a manual solution. Yes, it is, but no matter how automated current systems are in terms of steel fabrication, you still need an operator. Normally it's one operator per machine, uh, whereas here one operator can work on two bandsaws simultaneously. So this is a small example. As I said, next step would be automating it, so adding the uh, like platform and then setting the bandsaw in the right position and so on. But this is an example of where we want to go. And this is, I would say, Industry 3.0, which is basically black uh, or dark warehouses where no operators are required. Uh, in terms of reaching Industry 4.0, which is the Internet of Things, I think the steel industry is still way behind. And I, don't, I can't quite see a reason why the steel industry would necessarily want to do that. Uh, because we have to remember that at the end of the day, what our customers need or what we need to supply to site is just a straight beam with some plates welded to it. So there's no point overdoing uh, things in terms of innovation. 
uh, we've decided to go a step further. So instead of working on a robot that would attach and weld items to a beam, we thought, well, what's behind it? And we've came to a conclusion that the next step will be 3D printing of steel. Uh, we are working now with, uh, s well, some partners are listed here, but I'll say the main driving force is Foster and Partners. Uh, we're also working with Professor Leroy uh, from Imperial uh, and Cranfield University. <coughs> Uh, and we've started by sponsoring a master's on a 3D printed end plate. It has been chopped for testing because lack of fusion to the cold uh, existing beam. This is obviously version 1.0. Uh, the part of the thesis was to do around 30 of these plates and test them, uh, bearing in mind that each one of them had different parameters of depo deposition. So I'll just uh, hand it out. Uh, it is version 1.0 uh, and the interesting thing was that we printed it out and when I went to Cranfield to look at it I said no it's too rough. So the uh, question back was well how smooth do you need it to be? I was like oh my god I have no idea because I would like it to be as smooth as a real plate but then on the other hand maybe there's no need for it. And that is how we started building our whole partner group because it turned out that that simple question was much more or requires much more knowledge than, than just answering with a specific number. Uh, so we are now applying uh, for an Innovate UK grant to move it to the next level. And this is probably the first time uh, 3D printing is used in structural steel. Uh, we've got a construction company that is willing to put in the first steel beam with uh, 3D printed items on it. So, so hopefully we can push that so we'll make a next milestone which is having a 3D printed item on site. And in the future, I can see it, or I can see two various, uh, I have two different visions. One is that the whole fabrication process will be fully automated. So once our detailers send the drawings to the production floor, everything from stock handling to, to painting, everything will be done automatically. Uh, the other one which we're working towards is having robots on site working in a hybrid way, so having normal steel beams delivered to site, but then the connections being welded uh, or printed on site. So this is what the setup was, was a robot. This is what you have in your hands. And you might also argue, well, this is just on a straight plate. Yes, we do understand, same as in technology. Formula One's a great example. 31 years ago, we had these front wings. Now we have these pieces of art and the same will be with, with this uh, 3D printing it will evolve. So we've got our own robot now. Uh, it will be up and running very soon with some delays in delivering parts but, but we are on it so, so we'll be soon having the capability of printing things in-house. And it's also quite interesting when talking to Cranfield that actually it's sort of easier to print new items than it is printing 3D items on existing material. It's because of the heat or the cold mass of the existing beam. And this is an example from Foster's because they've got their uh, powder 3D printers. So this is sort of the shape that we would like to replace with an optimized connection. And this would use probably 30 or 40% of the material in this connection. But obviously this all has to be validated through our universities and so on. So it's still a long journey, but we are moving forward. This is another example. Uh, these are simple glue lamb steel connections. And then again, through various optimization uh, stages, we've ended up with these sort of end products. They're still not beautiful. They optimize from the engineering point of view, but then architects can also have their say and just have beautiful nodes. Uh, and again, this would be a hybrid system where the node would be printed in 3D, but the plates themselves would be welded uh, onto these fin plates because it's pointless printing half a meter of steel plates if we can just chop it and punch or drill holes through it. Uh, there's an option that maybe one day the whole superstructure will be printed uh, in 3D but from the financial point of view I think it's going to be a very long time before that happens. Uh, this is obviously printed from powder not from a welding machine. Uh, and obviously, if we start optimizing the density of the material, then the sort of correlated issue is fire resistance, because obviously this structure would burn like crazy because of the large surface. 
Next, uh, we did experiment with artificial intelligence, although that was like five years ago before AI became the sexy word. Uh, uh, and the reason was very simple. When we receive drawings to quote steel structures, our estimators have to spend a lot of hours going through all the details, highlighting it and making sure they don't miss out on anything and then importing the data or typing in the data into uh, our IT systems. So we thought, well, computers are much better at scanning, so why don't we write a program that would actually just scan through the document and, and basically export the data. And we did sort of get to the first stage, and this is a real output of the program, where it did find the, the description of steel items, <coughs> plus in the text it would highlight anything to do with steel. So if it's bearing plates or stiffener or full weld or anything like that, it would find it. And the reason why it had to be AI was so that it was self-learning. So if we run, let's say, 200 of these projects, it would have enough data to start thinking for itself and predicting where steel could be. And then, and the funny thing is, and we've parked this project probably like four years ago, uh, and the reason behind that is very trivial, but it's the data, amount of data. One page back then weighed around 10 meg, so a 10-page document was 100 meg, so 10 projects was already one gig. And cloud storage is still quite expensive, and, and that sort of, well, we decided to put it on hold. But we are happy to sort of uh, revive this project and take it from where we left it. I think there's a lot of potential in it because our next step once we ditched this program was to approach structural engineers to sort of work with them so they could export the data but that didn't quite work out. So then we started experimenting with a different tool and this is for the smaller end of steel projects. It's basically to enable builders to order steel online. So we've created a platform called Mr. Beam. It is up and running but please don't confuse it with this guy. Uh, and this is what it looks like. The whole idea is based on the shared economy. So we've got the platform ready and we have partners signed up at the moment. It's obviously Stilo, which is the partner of Mr. Beam. And we've got a company, Jack Steel, here in Manchester, well, not far from here in Manchester. Uh, and we're literally now at the stage of finding partners and working with them. So the customer goes over to this website, chooses what they, they need, and then they choose the uh, their partner, the fabrication partner, who will deliver the steel. And it's all based on postcodes and so on. So it's actually the Uber, but for structural steel. Uh, next, I'll touch upon ERP. I probably shouldn't be saying it here in Trumbull House, because I might not be let out. Uh, but I'm a big fan of the theory of constraints, and the author is Eliahu Goldratt. I really recommend his works. Uh, his idea is, and it's all based on Lagrange equations, that in the real world we have too many variables, call it noise, in order to be able to define every second of every resource. And his approach is that forget about all the noise, just find the global minimum of the whole, uh, let's say, on a process, and only focus on the global minimum. Now it's much easier to show it with this picture. ERP packages, and I've learned that, well, 15 years ago at university, they try to optimize the path of this person approaching this gap in the wall. So they would literally try to de describe every second of the movement of the hands, of the feet, of the head, and so on, and optimize the best path. Whereas Goldred said, forget about this, just allow them to head in that direction no matter how they, they wish to get there but the only thing you need to make sure you control is the bottleneck. So you find you will specify a bottleneck in the whole process and that is the constraint and you regulate the whole system. That means that other processes up and after the bottleneck, they have built in overcapacity. But as I said, it's, it's, it's a long read and there's a lot of material behind it, but I'm a big fan of it. And it's really done wonders at hours. We do around 15 to 20 projects a day. Yes, they are smaller projects, but it's only thanks to his works. I went to, to the States for some training about it. And it's really, really helpful for bespoke manufacturing. And steel, structural steel is bespoke manufacturing. Uh, we've also made that decision back in 2013 
to write our own ERP system. So we work with a company based in Poland uh, and we've spent probably around £200,000 to date on this system, which is probably quite a lot. But then compared to other software that we've tried before and the cost per user, uh, we decided to actually write our own and now it's paying dividends. This is the backbone of our uh, operations and instead of us having to transform to meet or to, to adjust to the way the software works, we could actually write the software that supports our business operations. Uh, and this is how we're able to guarantee delivery slots to our delivery slots plus automated emails informing customers that we are delivering your steel and so on. And all our quoting, CRM, everything is built into the system. Uh, and all this is also based uh, on a browser, so literally I can go into the system now and just see the progress of works. And obviously all these colors, they are different statuses of, of works. As a company, uh, my main job are consolidations. So I'm looking for mergers and acquisitions. As I said, I'm, I'm a big fan of innovation, but in order to uh, fund innovation, we need to be part of a much larger group. And I, want, I am in the process of building that group. Uh, every innovation project has been funded by ourselves, uh, bearing in mind that we are a well, four and a half million pounds this year in terms of turnover. We've already financed quite a lot of interesting ideas, but if we can multiply the amount of funds available for our innovation, I'm sure we could move at a much faster pace. Uh, and our main idea is to set the new standards of service. That has always been the main driving force before I started the business and every day at, at ours is about the standards of service. My mission is to build a global conglomerate which would be will cover most of the world. Uh, what we're interested in is the legacy of the existing companies. Uh, and it's happening more and more in Europe and in North America where there are plenty of companies that the owners are reaching their retirement age and we are happy to sort of bring in our new energy and, and keep the companies going. We're obviously hiring all the time, so if you know anyone who would be interested in joining our energetic team, then these are the values that we are looking for. And my favorite one is the last one, which is the only constant is change. So as I mentioned, uh, I really welcome anyone to sort of collaborate. I'm happy to visit you and if we can innovate together, uh, hopefully we can create a better world, which I think is part of Trimble's uh, mission. So yeah. thank you very much.